The following conversation is with the Greek, John Garopoulos from South Carolina. John has been racing homing pigeons since 2010 and has quickly rose to the top of the one loft game here in the United States. John has won the California Classic, the Crooked River Challenge, and the Hoosier, just to name a few. John talks about his process of how he selects his breeders and pairs them up, how he prepares them for the breeding season, how he vaccinates his youngsters, and how he selects them for the one loft. If you're a fan of one-loft racing, I think you're going to really learn a lot from this interview, and I really appreciate John's time. Thank you. All right, John Garopoulos, the Greek, right? Yes, sir. You uh, and I met back in 22 at the Hoosier, and... My wife and I were there, and not only do you have amazing pigeons, and you're an awesome guy, and it's great to meet you, but your pork chops that day, I haven't had anything as good as that. I've tried to oh, find man, as, good, as good a food. That makes me happy you remember that part. Oh, I do. I, I talk about them today. Whenever I eat pork chops, like, well, you wouldn't believe it, but in Indiana, I had the best ones I've ever had. So That's good. That's good. But, that's yeah, good. That, that's uh, one of my favorite memories of that trip was eating the food you made. It was awesome. That's great, man. That's great. I love to cook. You know, it's my job, but it's kind of when you get out there, especially outdoors with friends, I like doing it even more, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, how did you get started? Where where did it begin for you? How old were you when you first got your first pigeons and what, what got you into this game? Well, as far as I can remember, I think I was about 10 years old or 11 years old or 12 about that range when I started in uh, my country, in Greece, when I started with pigeons. That's when I first got into uh, very common over there, just general high-flying pigeons. Uh, they're like, in my neighborhood, there's probably 50 homes and like 20 of them had pigeons. So it's very common, a lot of people to have them on the uh, flat tops, you know, the houses were right. just... Uh, flat and the people had them on the roof or people had them in the backyard uh just a high flyer just general not some certain you know uh it was a lot of different kind of pigeons crosses majorly you know but basically high flyers you know and there were some donics in the area and uh those that will spin when they come down right and the divers is, was the most common uh breeds over there where i grew up uh and uh that's how we started me and my brother we both had the pigeons and a lot of friends you know no money to buy pigeons back there i mean my dad wouldn't give me money we were not you know very comfortable uh economically so he wouldn't be like here take a hundred uh dollars to go buy pigeons or ten dollars or nothing it was just from friend to friend here take one and you know just like it is here in some some uh, times, some of the new club, new members right. of clubs, you know. Uh, yeah, that's how we started over there. And then when we left the United States, I kind of gave up on them. Uh, we moved. Uh, the whole family moved here and kind of forgot about them and couldn't have them then, couldn't afford to do anything like that. Just went to school and uh, finished school and... Uh, I had to go back to Greece two or three times for different reasons. And uh, when we came back, uh, I think it was 2004 that I started back again with the pigeons in the United States. And that was with uh, the uh, nose divers. That's what, uh, that's what I started back. And uh, I had a I had a house, you know. I had a big yard, a couple of acres. Still living in the same house now, uh, and uh, had the. Uh, but it was, you know, I had the divers. My brother come visit, and like kind of that's it. There's no competition, nobody to show. In Greece, they have different competitions where people will go from house to house, and they'll have compete like who will have the best flight. You know, right? Uh, but but here it was nothing, and then 
uh, I was getting uh, more and more uh, watching, start watching the uh, home pigeons because there's a lot of people here with that. And uh, 2009 is when I started uh, uh, with the home pigeons. And 2010 is the first year I flew in the uh, club. How old were you when you came over here from Greece? I was 14 years old or 15, something like 15 years old, I think it was. And then uh, when you first started getting into the homing pigeons, how old were you? Mm, man, ask me hard questions like that. I got to pull my calculator out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably my, you know, 35 years old, something like that. Yeah. Started, yeah. So how did you decide to do homing pigeons? What uh, what caused you to decide to do that and get in a club and everything? We, we went to a... When I was buying my feed, uh, the feed store closed, and I asked the feed store, I said, Mandy, you know where I can buy my feed from now on? And they're like, well, yeah, you can. Uh, there's a guy here has a pigeon club that uh, is the president of the club, which uh, his name was Tommy Axon. Uh, asked me, uh, I asked for his telephone number, and I got it, and me and my daughter went over there to pick up feed, and sure enough, he sold us some feed, and I, he was he had like three four hundred pigeons you know yeah so i'm looking i'm like whoa wow what what's going on here you know i was like something that got me a little more uh interesting in it. and they kept watching and watching so man so my daughter's like dad look he's got some whites I see yeah sure does so tell me what do you do with his whites oh he said there's just for wedding releases and things like that and I do that on the side, so I said, cool. And uh, my daughter kept asking by the wife. She wanted to see him. She wanted to touch him. The next thing I know, we're living with uh, a pair or two pairs of uh, white homers. So he gave me to get kind of started. and, and yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't want to get started, but he's like, you want a pair? I said, sure. So we got two pairs. Uh, they were babies, you know. Right. So we put them, come home and build me a little bitty coop. Like a two by four, a little bitty, like a rabbit hatch. Right. Kind of pen, you know? I glued it inside of my, uh, nailed it inside of my uh, diver's uh, coop. So, and uh, build the trap and start letting them out and go out and come back and trapping in. So, like, man, that's kind of cool. So, is it that, that was the start? You, you, were, you were hooked at that point, do you think? Yeah, that's exactly right. Took him to work, took him to the restaurant, and released him. And they, they flew back home after they were like, you know, two or three months old. And they came and got in and trapped in, and that that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, did you say that was what year was that around the time frame? Two thousand ten. Two thousand nine. Nine. It was uh, yeah yeah nine. I had two thousand nine I had a I had a few pairs by the end of the year uh breeding you know yeah i started making have room pushing the divers and have making a little more room for my uh homers so right yeah and where are you located south carolina south carolina, south carolina. Yeah. okay and so uh you joined the club there and started competing at a club started, level started uh, competing in 2010 i was in the club then uh 2011 start flying uh Start dipping my uh, feet into the uh, uh, one loaf races. So whenever you're going to start out in 2010, 2011, when you're kind of getting started, uh, what was some steps that you took to learn, you know, the process of racing and, uh, you know, getting to come home competitively and all that? Well, I mean, I was reading, studying left and right, a lot of different things, uh, how to do this, how to do that, talking to people, not a local, not a lot of local help, okay? Yes, if you ask, they'll answer you, but I didn't have somebody where they come to come here and say, hey, come here, let me show you something. You look at this, and you look at this, and you look at this. Right. You know, uh, you got to have, you know, that's hard to do. You know, uh, especially at the club level, you know, when you have somebody, let's say you have an older guy, like a neighbor, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was, it's really, 
very good to have somebody to show you face right. to face. You know, grab right. the bird. I did not have that. So uh, I wish I did. It might have helped me. And then again, it might have been the same. You know what I mean? I, I can't right. say. Uh, I mean, I I know I see today there's people that they're willing to learn, but they want somebody to show them face to face, not internet to read or read a book. It's two different stories. Or call somebody and ask them a question. They'll answer you, tell you something. But if you have a good friend, that's really helps a lot, you know, close right. to you. Yeah. Right. So at, at what point uh, do you think it kind of, was it just trial and error you had to kind of learn as you go to? That's exactly oh, right. Yeah. Start looking, talking to people. Uh, that was my main thing. That thing that's calling people out of the blue, pick up, say, I want to talk to such and such. I think he's doing good. I'll go find his number, chase him down and call him and talk to him, you know? Right. Uh, so that was, I mean, I don't know if that was good or bad. Maybe some people hate me doing that, but I did it. And uh, I believe I got, I got a lot of things that I needed to, to get me going, you know, uh, talking to some local one off racing people, uh, Merrill, Mr. Merrill Emerson. Uh, he had a one off race here. He was very, very big help to me. Uh, but it was, he was like, you know, 30, 40 minutes away. He wasn't here to, you know, I had to go to his house and spend a lot of hours which he was retired, you know, but sometimes I'm sure it's like, man, you need to go home, you know, right, <laughs> it's, right. it's getting dark. You know? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, you, you just had some people like that. Uh, I had some people like that. that helped me. Merle Emerson, uh, Frank Esposito got two different people, two different ideas about things, medication, handling pigeons, you know, breeding pigeons. It takes a lot. You know, right, and then you got to have money to mm -hmm. test them. You know, if you have a you know, making $12 an hour or working somewhere, you cannot afford to, to raise pigeons. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah you got to be a little know. better than that in order to do that. You know, yeah, so you were able to get advice from them and kind of watch what they were doing and then kind of uh, apply it to what you were doing, you know, whatever you thought the pros and the cons were of what they were doing. You were able to kind of form it to what you were doing and exactly that and your club flying kind of learning as you go. Picked what I liked and left what I didn't like. And, and club flying was, you know, I, I'm still flying today. Club. Yeah. So, and what is, what is your club that you're in there? Uh, it's Greenville uh, uh, racing pigeon club. That's How many members? Club. Uh, about nine or 10 members. Mm -hmm. Uh, it varies. We don't go down to five members. And when I joined, it was like 15, you know, 18. The combine had about 30 members, you know, the two clubs. So it was a lot more people and a, more, a lot more competition. But as we all know, all this is declining, you know? Yeah, exactly. My club similar when I was uh, back in 2011, there's probably 30 people that were consistently flying. And now, you know, we'll get anywhere from 10 to 15 at most. And it just depends on young birds or old birds. So it, it's that way everywhere across the United States. That's why I'm so jealous of all the Belgian guys and guys. Oh, and yeah, and yeah. they, they have those numbers to compete with. But, um, you know, that's that's one of the reasons one loft so big in the USA, right? That's why. And I believe it. It helps. Uh, I just had an interview with uh, Mrs. Steve Berikoff on uh, on uh, Pigeon Digest, uh, and uh, we talked about some things like that. And some people think that the one off races are killing the, the club racing, but uh, I think it keeps the, the the hobby alive. You know what I mean? Because I absolutely not agree. Not everybody yeah. can. Yeah, not everybody can can fly pigeons in the backyards, or you know, don't have enough room, or don't have a, you know, the neighborhood doesn't allow it because of restrictions and they don't want to show the pigeons. They just breed and send out and keep it quiet, you know? 
Yeah. And I, you know, if it wasn't for one lofts, I never would have met you in person. And there's plenty of one loft events that I drive to or have flown to and met people that if it wasn't for one lofts, I never would have met them and become friends with. And so I think that one loft really does help with the social side of things too, to be able to meet people. It does. It does. I mean, I, I love going to, to all these events. I mean, I, I like what I can, you know, I can't go to all of them. I'm, you know, I'm in the restaurant business uh, and it's hard to, to get yeah. away Yeah, many times, but big events, I like to, to participate to, you know what I mean? Right. So it's, it's good to, to, to be able to see all you people, uh, you know, your competition, you know, but still yeah. we all become friends when we get together and together, you know? So, yeah. Uh, Pigeon's been good to me. So I've got me a good hobby. I enjoy it. Uh, look, go in the coop every day and, you know, every night. Uh, yeah. Just, just uh, get away from work and do something that you love. It, it's really important, you know. Does it, yeah. does it bring you a lot of peace to be able to do that and get away? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah my, my personal job is stressful, you know. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, uh, coming home and, you know, going into the coop and spend another hour after work, it just kind of relaxes you and makes you kind of forget if you had a bad day at work. Right. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. The pigeons are therapeutic for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move into your pigeons as far as uh, what, where did it begin for you to get the kind of pigeons that you're competing with today? Because uh, when you look at one loft results, your name's always uh, up at the top for ace pigeons and average speed and, and first drops. And so where did all that begin for you? Well, I started uh, 2012, I think I started, I bought a couple of birds, you know, I made some uh, you know, some made it some pairs that worked out for me and uh, talking to people kind of helped me decide what I want and uh, bought one loaf, uh, uh people from doing good in one loaf races, bought from them and flying in the club. And I, I, I was not, I'm not the one to say, okay, I'm going to spend $20,000 and buy a pigeon. I can't, I can't do that. You had to be very selective on what you right, got. Right. right. I bought pigeons over the years and I still buy, but I will not buy, spend a lot of money to buy one pigeon. Right. I just can't do it. Can't afford it. I got, you know, daughter in college. So it wasn't my thing to do. Right. Uh, breeding an ace pigeon is, to me, it's very, very, uh, I don't know how to say that. If you feel like you won the lottery, you know right. what I mean? Just, just it's a, a hard thing to do. Exactly. And when you do it, you're like, man, I can't believe I put A together and B together and they produce a champion bird. And when you do it again and again and again and again, it just kind of like whatever I'm doing, it works out. Okay. Uh, so you kind of get, you know, give credit to yourself to keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, it's breathing is where it's at, you know mating the right pairs and but who knows who's the right pair for who you just go with your gut and if the results there you're like okay it yeah. worked out but uh 20 uh out of 25 is not gonna, they're not going to work the matings for example right. you know right but if you get five good pairs you're going forward you know yeah so it's it's very hard but it's also, uh, you know, uh, some people say either you got it or you don't, but also you can learn, you know, from people or learn from yourself. If you got pairs breeding for two or three years and you moved them around already and you get nothing, you got to go on and, you know what I mean? Yeah. Move forward. Yeah. Get, change your birds, buy something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I've been buying some birds, but also trying to keep the key breeders that I think I need to go forward, you know? Exactly. And so whenever you're selecting a pigeon, because whenever we we met each other at the Hoosier, you were talking about a friend that was wanting you to help mate his birds, but uh, you told him, you know, I, I need to put them in my hands. It's important that I hold the birds. I remember you saying that, and I, I loved you saying that because I'm the same way. I like to hold the birds, and that kind of determines 
who I'm pairing with who on how they feel, you know, the, the genetics matter, but really to me, I want birds that complement each other. Is that something that you look for? Exactly what I do. I go breeding when, when, when I'm about to start breeding the pigeons, I'll, uh, course you know go through all the medication vaccinations whatever you're gonna do when i'm ready to breed a lot of my friends they'll have a you know they'll have a pad and have where the pairs mating and i really love when they do that but i can't do it right i'll have four pairs on paper maybe when i go to breed 55 pairs i got out of there made none I have only five in the book, four or five. The rest of them, I had to do them within two days uh, of time. I go grab my hand and go in the cock loft. Mm -hmm. Pick up the cock, put them in their nest, go grab the hand. The same thing. That's what I do. It probably takes me about two, two and a half days before I'm finished with the breeding. Now, if I had everything in the pad, it would be a lot easier. But I just can't do it. It, it kind of, I think it's harder for me to do it on paper. I just can't. I have to grab the bird, feel it, and then go find the mate. I mean, of course, the pedigree is already in my head. You know, because right. you, you don't you don't go look at your pedigrees the day you're going to breed. You should already know your, your pedigree. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, that's part of being ready to breed, studying your what you got. Being a student uh, of the game is important. And if you have a family of birds, it's really easy to remember those pedigrees. I mean, I, I have them all 55 pairs. All the pedigrees are in my head. Yeah. Maybe five pigeons, five new pigeons that I don't really know by heart, but I really know what the basically the bloodline is, you know? Right. But I would remember, you know, I bought a couple of birds from, you know, Thomas Baldwin. I wouldn't remember the band members of the parents. Right. But I would know really what the, the family is, you know what I mean? The family tree. So So can you describe to the to the to the audience what you're looking for in your hands? Can is it something you can describe as far as what you like to pair with what kind of body type or wing or what are you looking for when you're pairing in your hands? I like a tight vent on the pigeon. Uh the adults, of course, you know, that you're gonna breed. I like a tight vent. A lot of my pigeons are on the you know, medium, uh, some of them to large, to really large. Uh, and I also have some smaller pigeons. Uh, usually it's smaller hens. Uh, I mean, I like to cross the, the, when, I, when, I, when I breed. Uh, if I have a small hen, a tiny hen, like a little peanut, I will give her the bigger male that I'd like to breed her with, like or, you know, the pedigree wise, of course, matters, but also I want to give her a bigger size pigeon. Right. You know, now when I come to an end and I have a medium hen and I'm supposed to give her a medium male, there's no problems there. It's just don't worry about it. But I will not put a monster male, like, you know, who's your daddy with a monster hen. Right. I don't want that, not to raise anyone. Right. If I'm gonna breed or line breed to sell a bird for somebody or something like that, it doesn't matter. Then what I'll do. But if I'm gonna raise them, I, I like to have something in the middle. You know. And if you put a little tiny hen with a little tiny male, and you got you know little sparrows, I, I don't I don't like that either. Yeah. So you're trying uh, to you find that, that medium, that medium you're, size. You're still gonna get that. Mm -hmm. You know, those birds that I really don't like, those little sparrow birds, but I might still get them. But right. if I get a bird like that, most likely I just leave it at the house to fly in the club. Right. So when you're selecting a one loft bird, when you're going through the youngsters that you've bred after you've put your pairs together, you're trying to find that medium size to send out to the one lofts. Yes. Okay. I do. I do. I mean, I got to like the bird. I got to like how tight it is. Uh, tight vents. One pin tail is not always my, you know, way to go. I, I like it, but you know, I got some, you know, breeders that breed well that don't have that. Right. Uh, you know that one pin tail. It's not uh, my 
way to go to when I'm breeding or selecting breeders. Yeah. Right. No, I, uh, I like great. alert birds. Uh, I don't like birds that when you walk in the loft, they act like a hawk went in there. Uh, I don't like those birds, but there's a lot of families that will do that. Uh, most of my birds are kind of tame, you know. Uh, of course, they don't. I don't sit in the loft and they sit on my shoulder all day. I don't. I don't have that kind of that kind of time. You know, that takes time to have your birds. You know, you feed them and sit on the floor with them and all that. Uh, I don't. I don't have that. Uh, you know, I don't have that much time, or I don't have that. You know that. Uh, I don't like to do that, you know. I understand. Not, so yeah. when you're in there, you want to have you want them to have some, you know, con you want to have control of the room you're in, not wild flapping around. You want to you want them to be at least comfortable that you're in there and they know that you're the one that cares for them and not not yeah, a predator right. of some sort. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference between a pigeon that wins in a club versus a pigeon that wins in a one loft? Have you found a difference or is it the same kind of bird that can win either way? There are some birds that fly in both uh, places, some families, I would say, uh, but some of them will not do it. There are some one loft birds that will not do uh, uh, any good at club flying. Now, that can be location and race course, or that can be the handler, uh, the family birds. I really don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I have found myself that I had some birds doing well in one loft races and also doing uh, that, you know, young Picasso line that I had. Yeah. Tested them on both places and they flew good in both. Flew good at home, hard races, mediocre races, uh, 300, 400 miles, 500 miles, flew good at home and also flew good still flying good today in in in, in the one off races so it's uh but there are some families that they fly champion they they breed they, they fly really good at the club and do really good for the handler but when those guys send that family out to one of races they can't even clock in the front page of the race you know year after year after year and but when they put that family with something else for example, that did good in all of races, they can see, you know, they can see some some good results. Yeah, and I think that uh, when you're flying birds in a club, they're under your control, under your medications, under your training, and your conditions of the loft, and they get more one-on-one -on -one time versus a one loft. The bird has to fly home to a perch. He has to, uh, you know, get fed when he gets home under the same conditions and sometimes in some of these one loft races, it's with other thousands of pigeons, you know, you have your smaller races where they may get a little more, you know, time one-on-one, -on -one, but they have to be able to adapt to the situation they're in. And that's not always easy for them. I understand. That's why the, those races, they all go, you know, three, three days after the race, they're getting back on the road. Some of them two, two days. If you have your own, uh, you know, your, your own bird, you see this hen or this cock, she doesn't look right. You go, because she was late, you're going to leave her at home and you try to babysit the pigeon. Uh, the wall of races, they just, everybody sweeps back in the trailer, down they go. So yeah. some of these birds, they will not adapt to that. They can't do it uh, because they have still problem from the previous race. You know what I mean? They're, they were late or something happened to them. And uh, those are all off birds. They, they take a bidding. Yeah, and they have to have good immune systems as well to be in an environment like that, too. Well, for people that aren't as familiar with Greek Connection Lofts, can you talk a little bit about your one loft accomplishments over the years? Oh, I have to go pick up my, find my magazine. <laughs> well, I know uh, the uh, Lucas Kramer's race, the Crooked River, you had not too long ago an ace pigeon there, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, 2021 uh, first ace uh, with uh, Super Crack 37. Uh, that's uh, you know that's I love uh, that Crooked River race since 2016. I think I've been flying that race, and that was the first year that Lucas uh, think opened, and uh, I won the final race the 350 with uh, 
did you name uh, who's your daddy? Of course, I named him after he won, but you know, it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. Uh, won the three fifty, and then I've been doing you know not great every year, but always you know uh, thing except one every year I've been getting a check out of there, which is good. You know, even that's incredible. The, yeah. Right. Uh, I love the race, love the speeds. Uh, the most important thing is when I get my birds back, they're like diamonds, you know, right? ready to, to leave them in, the, in, in my breeding loft because they just like, they've been taken care of well, you know, right. you can and tell the detail. Matters. Yeah. That matters. He trains good, takes care of him good. And, and I had good results there. So, uh, you know, I've been supporting that race since 2016 and, and I love the results. Uh, yeah, won there uh, several years. Uh, 2016 with Who's Your Daddy? And uh, here's the thing. Uh, Who's Your Daddy's mother is uh, 527, uh, my hen. Uh, the champion bird's mother, again, it's 527. Uh, so it's like, you know, uh, a lot of the same and same birds are winning for me over and over again. With, you know, different mates or sisters or brothers, just uh, same family keeps doing it over and over again. So very happy with that. Uh, I mean, I won the California Classic twice. Uh, first place, uh, 305 miles first, and then uh, that was 2019 and 2020. Won it again with a full sister. Wow, I mean, that was like uh, unreal, you know, just uh, hard to believe something like that can happen, you know. Were you in person for any of this, or were you at the time no, you're probably not. working, right? I went to California Classic one year and didn't do good at all. Uh, but uh, I don't remember what year it was. But the 2019 and 2020, I wasn't even there. So, yeah. Yeah. So, did you, were you watching it on, uh, you know, computer or something, or did somebody like, call you? I don't like to watch the uh, Wood Companion. Uh, yeah. I try to keep myself busy. Busy. Yeah. So, I'd be like, if I'm home, I'd get in the coop and, you know, scrape floors or vaccinate pigeons or try to, to distract myself to keep me busy because I can't watch. Uh, I can't watch it. I get nervous. And yeah. I think I got better luck when I don't watch it. I mean, unless I'm there at the race, of course, yeah, you just right. uh, you watch. Somebody's going to scream your name, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good feeling when you're there and, and someone shouts out your name. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, so this past season, let's talk about the Hoosier because – you had a pretty big yeah. accomplishment there. Yeah, that was a dream come true, man. Dream come true, and it's like hard to. So how are you gonna come first? You know, it's like, man, this doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Be on the drop, yeah. It's but first in the hole, it's like, you know, with so many pigeons, it's like, like, just uh, luck is a big factor. You know, you you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. That, that, that pigeon at the Hoosier, it wasn't like a pigeon that was consistent or flying good. So, but, you know, it was there and you just don't know what can happen on the final race, you know? So everybody's in the same trailer and, you know, right. things can happen. Right. So, yeah, I just still can't believe the moment. Just, uh, I still can't believe it. Yeah. And did you, were you able to get that bird back? Yes. Yes. Good. She's here. She's breeding. Uh, she's breeding actually with who's your daddy, and that's uh, uh, it's a, it's a re related uh, uncle niece or something like that. I have to to see how you uh, how you gonna say that. Uh, who's your daddy is married to his sister's uh, daughter. So yeah, uncle niece. Yeah, yeah, yeah uncle niece. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, I got uh, four babies already from them. So. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That was uh when uh Carter, to me and Carter were you know, we're good friends. I support his uh the race they have over there in Omaha Grain Belt, great futurity. And uh he messaged me actually I was in Greece when he messaged me, he goes, Hey Greek, I bought 
uh, three of your birds, some for sale birds that were in the Hoosier, you know, for sale. I bought three of your birds. I said, well, oh, great. Thank you. I said, good luck. He says, I got a good feeling. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, well, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I got a good feeling about this. I said, good, great. Thank you. And then when this happened, I said, here's your message, man. Remember? So, man, I don't even remember that message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw him uh I saw him in Texas at the Flying D Paul Daniels race and he was still buzzing down there. Just, you know, he has a glow about him of excitement. And, and so that, that was a pretty awesome moment. I was really happy to see that you were able to get that and accomplish that. I know how amazing that must've been. And so that's, that's pretty amazing to accomplish that. So congratulations again. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So whenever you're breeding your pigeons for one loss, what is the process for medications, vaccinations? How are you setting them up for success to go to a one loft? Because I think a lot of people uh, don't happen or don't always make the right choices on what to vaccinate for, how you're medicating your breeders, and then, um, you know, as far as what age you're sending them, because those are important factors. Sometimes people send their pigeons too young and they're not able to build up that immune system. What do you do? I was vaccinating my young birds today. Okay, they're about from 25 days old to 30. Uh, some of them might have been, you know, 22. I really don't know. Whatever was, whatever was moving around the nest balls, they all got vaccinated today. I use this uh, vaccine. It's PMV and Rota. Uh, Rota, yeah. Combination. I've used different before, PMV only, but that's the one I've been using the last three years. And I don't, don't have any problems with it. Uh, so I vaccinate those babies. I'm going to give them a canker peel and I'll win them. Some of them I don't even win. I leave them in, in the loft. Some of my lofts are pretty big. You have plenty of room. Let the babies in there. I don't move all the babies and put them in, the, excuse me, in the one section. Right. Uh, so... I, I put them all, uh, like I said, now they're all vaccinated today. This weekend, I'll probably win most of them, but not all of them. I'll leave some uh, with the parents. Uh, and they'll, you know, once they get, you know, they'll have Avery access to look outside because people like, well, lock them up so they don't see outside. I don't believe none of that. Right. They were there. They sit out in the sun. You know, it's, I don't think that's going to make them leave the loft. Right. You take them to the wall of race. I agree. Uh, so let them be pigeons. Uh, medication, I don't give them nothing else. Just, uh, you know, when I ship them, I'll put a drop of uh, uh, what is it called? It's uh it's for uh, lice, and it's, it's a little uh, one drop, two drops behind the tail, mm -hmm. you know, for parasites. And yeah. Put them in the box. That's that's all I do. I shoot some water down the throat. Uh, if it's summertime, if I ship now and it's cold, I don't, I don't do nothing to them. Put them in the box uh, and ship them to the race. Don't overcrowd them. My boxes, I like to get those bigger boxes. You know, don't overcrowd the, the, the birds in there. I never had any problem with any young young ones, you know, getting stuck in the mail and, you know, uh, dying. So, but it happened to some people. When they get right. stuck in the mail, there's nothing you can do. You right. Know? That's out of your control. Right. Well, that's all I do. I don't medicate babies. Like I said, I just vaccinate them, give them a canker pill and that's all they're going to get and they're on they go i like them to get get a little older i used to ship about 30 to 40 days old when i started now i give them a little longer time here at the loft uh i like to watch them when i feed them i watch them how they act some of them uh if i take one and dip it in the water you know uh and then i can out of it if i have to dip it again that's not going to go to one off race. Uh, some people might agree with some things I say, but I'm just telling you what I do. I'm not saying no, I, that's I think that's great. 
I think yeah. that if a bird's, if you have to dip a bird more than once, it's not the type of bird you want to spend all that money right. sending because it's right. not going to figure right. things out. You just yeah. be donating just, at that point. Right. Just go and let it fly at the house. And, right. And at that point, it's, you know, it's, here you go. Here's your chance to, to show something. Uh, I pay attention, look at the birds, what they do. They come to my feet. They, uh, you know, go to the top perch and see how they act, how they carry themselves. The more time I see what they're doing, the more I can take decisions. Okay, I like this a lot. I'm going to send it to a favorite race, you know. Or the nest mate, I don't like it as much. I'm going to send it to a second dairy race that I'm not crazy about. Right. Uh, or it's like a lot less expensive and it's only like 300 bird uh, per bird a race and not 600 bird a bird race. Right. So that's how I make my decisions, who goes where. And uh, some families, mine, some peers doing better on the West Coast or, in the, you know, in Florida race or, you know, or in New Jersey race. So it's different birds. I still believe that, you know, horses for courses. Right. You know? I agree. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, so whenever you find a bird <clears throat> that can win at the California Classic or a bird that can win a Hoosier or the Crooked River, do you typically breed them and send their youngsters back to that race? And the siblings and the youngsters and the cousins, you know, just similar, you know, pedigree will go to that race. And that's what I do. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. And a lot people of people listening. are doing that. A lot of people are doing that. I believe nowadays they they will follow results where this family done good, and they'll try to to send there. So the competition is even harder because you know uh, everybody's doing the same things and everybody can get good pigeons. And uh, but it's very uh, important to do your homework at home and do the things right. Right. Uh, take care of the breeders. That's where it starts. Uh, give him, uh, medicate him. Uh, I know some people don't like to use medicine. They want to leave everything natural. Uh, I, I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that's one thing I love about these interviews is that there there really is not one way to go about any of this. Exactly. There, you can have a hundred different styles and have success uh, many different ways. And that's what's amazing about these pigeons as athletes is that um, the basics of just basic care can get you a long way, but then you have to decide for yourself and where you are and what your goals are to determine what you're going to do and, and what systems you're going to run. So uh, what medications are you giving breeders before this breeding season or is it during, or what, what are you doing there? During breeding, I don't give them nothing. I give them some probiotics and vitamins. Uh, I put some uh, uh, additional things for the youngsters. Uh, most likely for uh, like I put it in the in the in the feed in the mix. I have a little mortar mixer that I use just for feed uh, once a week or twice a week if I have time. I put my feed in there and mix it up and put some uh, uh, vitamins or different kind of minerals and some you know uh, brewers yeast things like that. You know I don't have anything set. I don't have a set schedule. Like, okay, because I changed things like two years ago. I didn't even vaccinate my breeders. Right. Okay. Uh, this year I did. I did PMV and Salmonella. Uh, last year I did PMV only, my breeders. Uh, like we just said earlier, there's a lot of different ways to roam, but right. I like to change some things. Right. So I said, well, I didn't shoot them for Salmonella for three years. Maybe I'll do it. Uh, I mean, you get some single eggs, you get some bad eggs, uh, you, you're like, well, I should with someone else and hopefully this won't happen, you know? Exactly. Uh, so you, you try to do things a little different. Nothing is written in stone about pigeons. Right. You know, all the people that say that they know everything and all this is the way, that's the way to do it. Yeah, there's not such a thing. Right. But I like to medicate, uh, at least for a month, I will medicate. Canker, coxie, uh, you know, I warm the pigeons. Mm -hmm. And I will uh, also use uh, 
uh, and reflex for 10 days. Uh, I've been doing that the last four or five years. Uh, not in particular way, you know, if I'm ready, you know, to, to start my treatment, if I have canker available, I'll start with canker. And if I need, you know, if I need to order the coxie, I'll start with that. Uh, it's not like, you know, uh, try to keep things more simple. What works, you know, for you, you know, pigeons adopt, but yeah. I have to, I have to treat my birds every year before breeding. Yeah, and I think I don't like to, to go in the middle of the season and start giving them canker and giving them this or giving them that. Uh, I, I usually by the time through them breeding, nobody gets nothing. Right. You know. No, I agree. I do the same thing for before the season breeding season starts. I get everybody medicated similarly the way you're doing it, worming and canker and coccidiosis, all those things to where once they lay and start, they don't need much else other than good quality feed and grit. And some right. probiotics. I the the Primalac uh, probiotics, one of the ones I use in the water. Um, I do some, uh, you know, oils on the feed here and there for amino acids and stuff. But I think pre pairing is where a lot of your races and one loft races and club races are won because your breeders have to be healthy to pass on the good immunity to the to the youngsters. And I think that's a good way to go about it. Another thing I realized over the years. Too many things in the water. When you start breeding, it's not good. I, yeah. I mean, I try to put less and less and less. I uh, I used to, if I need, uh, I, I I've been uh, I said that on my inventory the other day at the, at the magazine as well. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to use more things to go in the feed than yeah. in the water. Yeah. Uh, I don't like it when the breeders hesitate to go drink. You know. Yeah. Even the, the primal like when I started using the primal like they will they will go deep and, and back off the water. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. And then if you see these raining outside and they're you know, they're licking it off the walls, you know, right. the the trying to get the, the water. And I'm like, man, I'm you know, I'm don't like the when the pigeons do that. That that means to me that they're thirsty and they're not using enough water so they can pump the babies. Yeah, they're so, not able to get enough water to mix right. up the feed properly. That makes sense. So I don't think a lot of the people that putting a lot of, you know, people like, oh, I got to put this. I got to, that's in the market. I got to put more. I got to put this in the in the water. I got to give them this vitamin or that. I think that the less you put, the better it is. Yeah. You put straight water and then they go drink until they make noise. You know, you hear look, 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 they're like, you know. Right. So it's, that's what I like to see. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, are are you giving grit consistently to the breeders? Yes, yes, I do have. I use the Javati grit, like a lot of people nowadays use the mm -hmm. Javati, just because the birds love it. But I don't give them just the Javati. I mix it. I mix it with the plain Jane grit. Yep. I have like two or three different kinds. I put a little oyster shell, red grit, white grit. So I make the Javati less desirable. Right. So, and, well, why you want to do that? I said, oh, well, I believe that when you go there and you give them Javati, they'll just go over there and just divorce, just go crazy about it. Yeah. But, they'll destroy it. They'll eat it up quickly. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, do they get enough grain to pump to those babies or are they just giving them 70% Javati and 30% feet? Right. Uh, I know they mix it up or however they do it, but I just don't think they need this much grit. Yeah. You know? uh, just, yeah, they like it, but I, I, I just, you know, good or bad, I mix mine. No, I, that's the way uh, a lot of the top lofts that I've talked to do it. They mix it together with several different grits and it gives the pigeons plenty of options, but I'm, I'm with you. Whenever you do just Javati by itself, they'll eat it up in minutes and it's gone. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, so mixing it kind of helps plus Javadi is expensive. So mixing it helps it last longer. Exactly. Anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's what I do. Mix it up and, and let them, you know, let them eat the, they, they do it, you know, oyster shell. And I think helps with the quality of the egg and, uh, yeah, but, but I do give grit to the birds every day. 
Every time I feed, I also give them grit. Yeah. Yeah. Don't pile up big containers and grit. Let them sit in the loft because then you see there they won't use it no more. You know. Right. What about uh, for the club level? We've kind of gone over your one loft strategy. What are you doing for your racing pigeons that you fly locally? Are you uh, doing anything different in your routines? Are you flying any certain system? I don't have uh, young birds. I just like to, to fly them, you know, let's train as much as I can, race them. I don't change the a lot of the feed mixes to I try to find, see if I find me a new good pair or something like that, or find me a good pigeon. I don't play with the feed. A lot of people do and have good success, you know, uh, using light or heavy or whatever they do change. I like to keep everything the same. I do medicate, uh, just basically canker and coxy for, for flying in the, in the backyard. Uh, I also do use some antibiotics, uh, especially if we, uh, a lot of this uh, races, we start flying uh, some new guys are being, and all of a sudden you see you've got an outbreak and some sicknesses start to pop right. out. I, I like to give them some uh, uh, amoxicillin, the mm -hmm. first, uh, especially the first couple of weeks uh, when they get back home, the birds. So that's uh, basically train. Uh, hard and, and racing the young birds and see if I have anything good to the end of the year is worth for me to to put in my uh, breeding program for for the all of races you know yeah uh, I, I will definitely love to have a wall of race winner uh, with a you know with a combine winner uh, to, to to breed together and, and, and breed uh, have a great pair you know yeah because I've sense. done this several times <clears throat> yeah yeah uh, also, all birds, I try to fly widowhood. I'll say this is a lazy uh, guy's uh, method to fly uh, all birds, but I just love it, man. I love to watch them cocks in the morning, just spend an hour, an hour and a half and see how they act from week to week. It's like, man, it's like amazing, you know, yeah. what, what widowhood cocks do. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful to watch. It's easier, I believe, than flying uh, hens and cocks and separating them and you know uh, natural it's another way of doing it but all I've been flying all these years is widowhood right uh, this year I'm going to try to fly some cocks and hens just because I didn't have enough just to get a taste and see how it right. is you know right so I have like 10 uh, cocks and 10 hens and I will just fly them uh, like on a double widowhood system. I'm not a big fan. I'm not, I'm not a, let's say my knowledge in, in the club racing. I'm not like, you know, I, I watched Frank McLaughlin's the other day. He's so much into about his hands. He knows a lot of systems. He's seen it all. I'm, I don't have a lot of experience in that. Right. Uh, yeah, I do fly, but I'm not the guy to talk to about, you know, about this, what about that? Just because I fly the club, just to keep the club together, and, and also train me. Right. Birds come back and birds sick. I try to make it to fix things. Right. I think it's teaching people how to take care of their pigeons. You know, uh, a lot of all of guys don't want, want to be bothered with these things. You know, uh, right. just uh, why why should I bother? Well. Uh, I believe it helps, helps hold the club together. You know, uh, there's motivation for the people, you know, come to the meetings and, you know, so uh, I, I believe it helps me being an active member in the club to keep the club together. So, And you're able to use that data you get from the club racing, especially in young birds to benefit what your passion is of one loss. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Makes total sense to me. Um, what, is your proudest moment so far in, is it, is it the Hoosier? Is it the Crooked River? What, what was the most exciting moment for you that you, you can look back on and really be proud of? I mean, everyone has his own story about the pairing of a pigeon, about starting, you know, to, to believe, oh man, this pigeon is, is flying good at the training tosses and maybe see how it's going to end. 
I mean, I've won several first champion bird victories. And uh, the, the, the biggest, the birdage, the more, uh, you know, the more cheerful it is. Right. Or the more money. And also it's, you know, obviously the Hoosier is the biggest money I ever won in, in, in one loft race. Uh, being there, it was another positive to this, you know, just to, just can't describe the, you know, how you act. You look at the videos for like, shit, that was me. <laughs> like, well, how did I do that? <laughs> that's funny too, because I didn't get to go, but I, I saw some video of everyone congratulating you. And I was a little bit worried for you because people were almost beating you up. <laughs> they were, they were shaking you around and hitting you. And I was like, Oh, I hope John's all right. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's something that when you're there, just a different feeling. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, everyone is just to have this, you know, uh, Crooked River champion bird. That, that's, that was a big thing for me. And especially after, you know, that was the, the year that, you know, the, they stole the birds and, you know, you're kind of down and you think, well, man, most of my birds are gone, but I still have a little bit. So you still have some hope. And then, Winning the champion bird, it was just like, man, you know, it's like I'm back, you know. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, money helps, but money is not the only thing. It's also the breeding, you know. You still have the parents because sometimes, like, oh, gee, I don't have the parents, you know. Right. Uh, so it was like, yeah, a lot of good feeling, a lot of good times. I just can't say a one is just this is the only one I remember, you know. I just remember everyone has its own uh good about it so right yeah and uh we kind of covered this a little bit earlier <clears throat> i always like to ask everyone what's your advice to somebody who's new to pigeons or maybe they're getting back into it after being away for a while you you went over a little bit on how you kind of got started and i think it was great advice uh do you have any other you would like anything else you'd like to add to what advice you'd give to a new flyer that maybe starting out or someone coming back I will suggest what to know what they want to do. A, a flyer that's coming back, that knows a lot more what he wants to do. You just want to fly one of races or you want to fly, you know, the Hoosier race or the Crooked River or the Florida Pigeon Derby. Try to find who's you can. It's everything is uh, ready for them to go to the archives, see which lofts are being doing good there year after year after year. Call the person that you're interested to buy pigeons. You know, if there's GFL or Baldwin or whoever it'll be, you call them and say, listen, I'm such and such, introduce yourself. Nobody nowadays calls somebody to say something. It'd be an email or a text message. I know people don't like to get the, you know, privacy. You know, they, people don't even answer the phone nowadays, you know. But I believe calling somebody, talk to them person to person, it's different than just sending an email out. Right. I mean, thing or something, you know. Uh, I mean, I was that guy. I'd be, you know, the first guy. I remember. I'll never forget. It. I called John Melka. Hello, hey man, you got pigeons? I'm looking. I'm looking at your pigeons. I'm one of your fans. So, you know, uh, you buy something, and I'll give you something to help you out. You know, like a gift, and it, it kind of gets you get into somewhere, but. Uh, so look where you want to do well at, where do you want to support, which right, which race you want to support, or if you're going to fly at the club, start from your club, see who's right. beating the, beating the competition every week, go to his house and buy a couple of pairs. So, uh, that's the strategy that I would do it again. If I do it today, Yeah, you know, so, right. uh, so see what you want to excel at and then chase the people that did good over there that's the one way to start i think know? that's great advice yeah yeah is there anything else that we haven't talked about if, that i missed or anything else you want to cover i mean i don't know what to say uh i appreciate you for taking the time to get me out here in the air i really i wasn't expecting that because i meant i don't put me in the magazine because i just uh i just finished the magazine <laughs> oh no yeah yeah i yeah, I don't. Uh, I didn't want to take up a bunch of your time, but I think what okay. you've done in a short span, uh, you know, since 2010 has been pretty amazing. And I think uh, people know Greek Connection Lofts, and um, 
you know, I really think that people are going to enjoy hearing this so far, you know, I've interviewed different people from all over and I think you have an awesome story and, and some great, uh, a great blueprint on how people can get started in Excel. Uh, so yeah. I appreciate you coming on and thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, down the road, you want to do another of this, we can cover other things that you think we haven't covered and I'll be glad to, to talk to you, man. I really enjoyed it. When, uh, when is your article for the digest coming out? Do you know? It's already out. It's yeah. out. All right. Well, people yeah. can yeah. check that out. And do yeah. you have uh, any website or Facebook page or something people can yeah. check out if they want to contact you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You what can, is that? Uh, they can check me on uh, Facebook, uh, Greek Connection Lofts. So that's where I'm at. And, and I'm under my personal page, John Georgiopoulos. It doesn't matter where. I can answer them. And anything they want to know from me, they can just ask. And I'll uh, help them out if I know the answer. All right. Well, I really appreciate it, John. Thank you again. I know everyone's going to love watching it, and we'll have you Thank on you. again for an update here soon, uh, you know, as the one loft season approaches. So, Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it, Jeff. Right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Right All right. You too. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.